today's webinar. My name is James Hernandez, and I am an optical engineering intern here at uh, ZMAX. And today we're going to be talking about how to use Optic Studio to design uh, and model uh, interocular lenses. So jumping right into it, uh, interocular lenses are used as replacements uh, for damaged natural eye lenses. Now, you know, up to this point, the traditional design that's been used has been, uh, you know, single focal length or monofocal uh, lenses. But the problem with that is that, you know, patients with presbyopia and conditions of that nature are unable to focus on near objects uh, because the, you know, monofocal IOL is designed to work with uh, far vision. So anything from that far field is focused uh, perfectly on that retina, uh, but anything in the near field is not. So, you know, more modern techniques have provided another approach, and that is a multifocal IOL. Now, these lenses provide more than one optical power, um, which essentially allows the patient to focus on both near and distant objects. And for this reason, uh, these types of lenses are called uh, pseudo-accommodating interocular lenses. So here in this webinar, we're going to present how one might design a diffractive uh, slash refractive IOL. Um, now, this is the, uh, the basis behind the multifocal IOL, essentially using diffraction, where the power of the lens arises from the refractive surface coupled with diffraction effects. Now, these diffractive multifocal lenses have a large number of concentric annular zones where uh, light passing through these zones interferes uh, in a controlled way using optical steps. And here, we'll just show uh, that type of structure. So here you see those annular zones. And obviously, this, this figure is exaggerated here. You know, these zones are going to be, you know, micron-sized. So they're definitely not going to appear uh, that large. And in terms of that step structure, here's a figure demonstrating that, again, by using these steps, we're able to control the interference uh, between incident light and create these uh, multiple focal points. Now, kind of the basis behind this, uh, and this is going into, you know, how Optic Studio uh, can do this, the direction and propagation of these different diffractive orders uh, may be predicted by the diffraction equation, where again, M is the diffractive order, T is the grading period, and the inverse of the line spacing, uh, D. And here is that equation down below. Now, the designer should note that the diffraction angle depends only on the period uh, of the repetitive structure and wavelength, not the shape within that period. And that, again, is just going into uh, kind of the theory behind uh, diffraction, specifically even you know diffraction gratings. But the surface structure is what affects that diffraction efficiency, where that efficiency essentially describes the distribution of intensity between the multiple foci of a diffractive lens. Now, this is key here. This diffraction efficiency is not modeled by geometrical rays. Uh, multiple diffractive orders can be modeled in Optic Studio using multiple configurations, uh, but the efficiency is going to be assumed to be uh, quote unquote 100% for each. Um, in order to calculate the efficiency for a given surface structure, um, which is going to take into account uh, factors like the blaze angle uh, software other than Optic Studio should be used. Now kind of going into um, how Optic Studio can be used to, to design uh, these diffractive IOLs, computer-generated diffractive surfaces allow the grading period to vary spatially across that surface uh, so that we can add diffractive power uh, where it is needed. Now here, we're going to demonstrate the binary 2 surface. And the binary 2 surface allows the grading period to vary as a rotationally symmetric polynomial. Um, and that binary 2 is commonly used for correcting aberrations. Um, it does not model the wavelengths uh, scale grooves directly, uh, but rather it uses phase advance or delay represented by the surface locally to change the direction of propagation of uh, any ray. And again, going back to what we mentioned earlier, scattering efficiency or multiple order diffraction uh, is ignored. 
So kind of just breaking down what we're going to be doing uh, in Optic Studio here in a bit. Uh, we're going to first simulate an average eye. Now Optic Studio comes with a sample eye model that we'll show here in a bit. Now once we get that up, we will replace the lens of that eye model with a binary 2. Uh, we'll use PMMA as our material type, which is kind of a common material that's used for a lot of IOLs. And we're going to say that our front surface is going to feature our diffractive power. And it's going to provide two foci corresponding to the zero diffraction order. That's going to be our far focus. And the first diffraction order, that's going to be our near focus. And again, our retina is obviously going to act as our image surface. Now, to simulate each of those diffraction orders and analyze the images produced by each, we're going to use, again, our multiple configurations. And then we're going to optimize for you know, best RMS spot, uh, RMS wavefront, and control longitudinal aberrations. And again, here is the sample model that we'll be using for the human eye. Now, this can be downloaded on the knowledge base article, ZMAX models of the human eye. And it's included along with uh, other models, uh, additional models, including a non-sequential model. So that can be downloaded there. And before we jump into to designing this, we'll just show again the parameters that we're going to try to meet with our design. Again, our material is going to be PMMA. We're going to set that optic diameter or our clear aperture to be six millimeters, which is common diameter that is used in, in a lot of IOL designs. Uh, we're going to have an MTF requirement for both uh, distance and near vision, 50% contrast at 10 line pairs per millimeter and 50 line pairs per millimeter respectively. The total aberration RMS We'll say that's going to be 2.13 plus or minus uh, 2 microns. And again, finally, you know, the far vision focus is going to correspond to the zero diffracted border, and the uh, near vision focus is going to correspond to the first diffracted border. And you know, finally, the the front surface type is going to be aspheric and diffractive, while the back surface is just going to be aspheric. So now we'll jump onto Optic Studio and try to apply. Uh, these ideas to to a design. So like I said here, uh, we can go to the knowledge base article ZMAX models of the human eye and under article attachments we will find the sample file that we're looking for and we're going to use the eye retinal image sample file here. So we'll go ahead and open that. So if you look at here, uh, here is our uh, sample file modeling the human eye. So some of the main features here that we should just quickly note, uh, we have our corneal surface, which is represented by this lens, um, our iris, uh, represented by the stop, our crystalline lens, represented here, and finally our retinal surface, which acts as our image surface. As I mentioned before, uh, we can go into the lens data editor and we see that surface 6 and 7 represent the crystalline lens here. So we'll go ahead and say that we're going to replace surface 6. We're going to say it's going to be a binary 2. And surface uh, 7, we will change to a even A sphere. And it took me a while to find that. There it is. So we've changed it. Uh, surface 6 to binary 2, surface 7 to even A sphere. Now that takes care of that. Finally, we'll say that our material is going to be PMMA. Note that the sample file includes a, a material catalog for the eye where uh, the corneal surface, aqueous humor, and vitreous humor all have a material associated with them. 
So we've changed the material to PMMA. Our semi diameter, we're going to change to six. Great. And then finally, before we start, you know, trying to to alter, you know, radii and you know coefficients and things like that, we'll first have to set up our multiple configurations to model the uh, zeroth order diffraction order and the the first diffractive order. So, kind of just jumping in to how you would do that. Here is the multiple, uh, or excuse me, multi configuration editor uh, that I've set up here. So for that surface five, I've gone in and set that parameter to be zero and one for configuration one and two respectively. Field type for configuration one will be zero and that corresponds to an angular field. Again, configuration one is going to be our far vision zero with diffractive order uh, configuration, while configuration two is our, is our near vision configuration. So when we set one for that field type operand, we're saying that that's going to be uh, object height. The thickness, for again that far vision, we're just going to say that's going to be infinity. And for configuration two, we're going to set that to be 250 millimeters, and that corresponds to a normal uh, near point for the human eye. Now that may vary uh, depending on on what source you're looking at, but for this demonstration, we'll just say 250 millimeters. And then finally, we can use the Y field uh, operand to say for field two, we're gonna want that to be 10 degrees and 10 millimeters for configuration two. And then for field three, we're gonna say 20 degrees and 20 millimeters for configuration one and two. Now note that these are actually going to have different angular subtenses, but We'll assume that you know, for something in the near field, such as a book, you know, reading text, that's obviously going to have a smaller angular subtense than in the in the far field. So now that we've set that up, we'll go ahead and start the optimization process. So to ensure that both configurations uh, will be able to produce a quality image at that retinal surface, like I said before, we're going to use system optimization, both surface radii, fourth and sixth aspheric coefficients, and the coefficients for you know row squared, row to the fourth, row to the sixth, row to the eighth, will all be set as variables. Optimization performed for RMS spot size uh, will be done first, then RMS wavefront, and again, that's an iterative process that you know any you know good designer, experienced designer, will know. You know you're gonna have to kind of jump back and forth between those two. And finally, to correct for color, we'll include some longitudinal aberration operands in that merit function. Hopping back over to Optic Studio, I've gone ahead and uh, ran that optimization. Uh, like I said, it takes a while. And you know, just for the sake of time, I, I'm just presenting the results here. But again, I set that radii for five and six to be a variable, the conic and fourth and sixth order aspheric coefficients, and our binary two coefficients to be variable and optimized the lens. And before we proceed, just a quick note, there was actually an error on that table. Uh, that should have been a six millimeter full diameter. So I've gone ahead and changed it to, to three uh, millimeter semi-diameter. But just for the sake of demonstration, we'll go ahead and jump into our merit function editor. And this is what it might look like for some uh, step in the optimization process. Here, I'm working with these longitudinal 
aberration operands. Uh, you can see that I've had to specify them for each configuration and uh, the user uh, will need to do so if they're trying to you know optimize through multiple configurations. You know anytime an operand is uh, answered in to the merit function it should be specified what configuration it refers to. So kind of showing the results of that optimization we can jump into the uh, MTF plots and we can cycle through what configuration we're looking at. Here will be the uh, far field, here will be the near field. And you know, just from looking at the plot, the actual values uh, may not be apparent and we might not know whether we're meeting our spec or not. So we can just jump over to the text plot and see whether we're meeting that criterion. And it'll show exactly uh, what our value at each spatial frequency is. So that can be analyzed there. In terms of aberrations, we can go into our wavefront map. And again, we'll just dock that. We can go down here to the peak to valley measurement, and we'll see that our RMS values are located here. Um, and again, we can just cycle through both configurations. And again, that value is given in waves, so one would need to multiply by the wavelength to get uh, a value in microns. And again, a text file is included as well. So here, from our MTF plots and our wavefront maps, we can see that we fulfilled uh, the parameters uh, specified in the table a few slides uh, earlier. Now, before we finish up, I just want to quickly touch on a bit of an interesting topic, and that is designing interocular lenses for a specific patient where corneal topography measurements have been made. Now, in our previous demonstration, we designed our interocular lens with an eye model that used just a standard lens to represent our corneal surface. Now, that's fine for the sake of demonstration, but one of the biggest things that a designer must consider when modeling an interocular lens is balancing the aberration contribution between the corneal surface and the IOL. So let's say that a series of you know corneal topography measurements have been made and a set of uh, Zernike coefficients have been derived, which specifically show how a specific patient's corneal surface aberrates the incoming wavefront for incident light. So we can jump back in to our sample eye model, and you can see that I've done something where our file looks a bit different now. So instead of that corneal quote unquote lens, I've gone ahead and replaced that with a praxial surface and a Zernike standard phase. Now, the praxial surface has the same power as that previous corneal lens. And again, I've adjusted the thicknesses, uh, taking into account the, the principal planes uh, of the you know previous configuration, so everything has remained the same in, in terms of you know the power and you know the the exact uh, location of that uh, corneal surface. But now one can use this Zernike standard phase to import specific Zernike coefficients that will aberrate the wavefront 
as dictated by those coefficients. And in doing so, the interocular lens can be designed and optimized to correct for those specific you know, aberrations contributed by that corneal surface of that patient. And if one wanted to do so, one can simply go into the surface properties for that Zernike standard phase and go down to that import option and import a data file. And the exact notation for that data file can be found on the ZMAX uh, help files for that Zernike standard phase surface. Essentially, it can be you know, imported using you know, a simple notepad file. And once that is done, the same process that we showed earlier, essentially switching that to binary 2 and an even A sphere, making those parameters variable, again, the radii, the conic A sphere coefficients and the binary 2 coefficients, they can all be set to variable and that optimization process can be run. And again, if you know a set of Zernike coefficients have been uh, measured for, let's say, different pupil sizes, the multi-configuration editor can be used to set that up and the optimization process can be done through all of those configurations. And with that, we'll go ahead and conclude this webinar. I want to thank all of you for watching, and I hope that I presented some you know, useful knowledge, uh, tips and tricks to designing your own interocular lens in Optic Studio. Again, for more information, for a more you know, detailed step-by-step uh, -step process of uh, this design, please refer to the knowledge base article, Using Diffractive Services to Model Interocular Lenses.